Today we have Dr. Naomi Datsun with us. She is a senior lecturer in sport performance analysis at Ch uh, Chichester University and consulted to sports scientist. In today's webinar, she shares her experience of working in elite sports for more than 12 years. And you can submit your questions throughout the presentation in the chat box. We will address during the last 15 minutes. Naomi, you can start now. No problem. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the webinar today. Um, first of all, I'd just like to start by thanking Catapult, um, firstly, for running this webinar series, um, and secondly, for inviting me to be part of that series. I've worked with Catapult for many years across different projects, um, and I've always found their products and their customer service to be first class. So I was really pleased when they asked me to be part of this um, webinar series. So I've been asked to present today on my career. Um, and as mentioned, that will predominantly be um, working as an applied sports scientist. Um, and that was largely in terms of women's soccer. Um, but I've also transitioned more latterly into academia. So I hope you'll find today's talk interesting, um, even if you're not from a soccer background or also depending on which stage of your career you may be at. So people often ask me uh, how I started as a sports scientist or where I started. Um, and for me, um, that was starting at the Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra. But when people ask me about how I got that position, I often use the term lucky. So I say I was fortunate to get that position or I was really lucky and I was in the right place at the right time. But throughout this presentation, I'm just gonna kind of look a little bit deeper at that reference to whether I was lucky or not. But before we go any further, I love sport, but I also love films. So there's gonna be a few film references throughout the presentation and starting with this one, uh, which was a 90s classic called Sliding Doors. I'm not sure if people are familiar with the film, um, but the concept of the film was based around an individual woman, her, Helen, who was played by Gwyneth Paltrow. And in the concept of the film, uh, we saw two different uh, plots. So one where she got her train and one where she missed her train. And we see how her kind of career or her life panned out as a result of that Sliding Doors moment. And that's a little bit how I think about my introduction into sports science at the AIS. So I'll just explain that a little bit more. So I, in my second year of university, I was doing an assignment and I was studying in this building, which was the library at Liverpool John Moores University. And the assignment meant that I was relying quite heavily on this textbook, Physiological Tests for Elite Athletes which is a really popular textbook, um, which is now, I think, in its third edition. And while I was using this book, which was published by the Australian Sports Commission, I found myself on their website. And as I'm sure most of you have done this before, once you get on a website, you end up sometimes down a bit of a rabbit hole and, you know, you click on lots of different things and you end up somewhere different on the website. And that's what happened. I ended up looking on the vacancies page of the AIS. And that's where I really sort of feel my sliding doors moment came in because if I hadn't have taken that chance through all the website clicks and ended up on the vacancies page, I don't think I'd have ended up working for the AIS. But what I saw when I clicked on the vacancies page was that they were advertising for an internship um, within their physiology department. And the uh, position they were advertising looked fantastic and I was really excited about it. Um, the only downside was that they needed you to have just finished or nearly finished your degree. And unfortunately, I was only in my second year. So I had a whole nother year before I would be eligible to apply for that job. So as excited as I was about the opportunity, I was also disappointed at the same time because I obviously couldn't apply. So what I actually did was every week after that time that I saw that advert, I checked back on their website to see if they were advertising for the following year. Fortunately, about a year later, they did indeed advertise the position again. So I sent off as requested a copy of my CV and my covering letter, and I just waited. And I'm not sure if it was weeks or if it was a month later, but I got an email back um, and the email said, we got your application, you've got the job, uh, we'd love you to move to Canberra and can you start in September? 
and I think that was around about July, um, so it wasn't long. Um, and it's also crazy to think of that now. Obviously, we're all used to Zoom and Teams and online presentations, but they just offered me the job uh, based on a CV and covering letter. But it was a few years ago, so I guess things were a little bit different then. So just coming back to that kind of theme about a lucky break, uh, as I said, that's often how I describe it to people. But actually for this presentation and more recently, I've thought about that in a little bit more detail. And actually, I may have been a little bit lucky, but also I think throughout that year, I exhibited patience because uh, I had to wait a year for the opportunity again. Perseverance. I was on that website every single week checking back. Um, so, you know, I persevered with the role um, and also a little bit of courage. Um, courage initially to apply for the position um, and courage as well to move to the other side of the world where I didn't know anyone. So I took that leap um, and I moved from the family home in Worcestershire to Canberra um, on the eastern side of Australia. Um, I was 21. Um, I had no mobile phone because it was 2003. There wasn't really any internet. I didn't have anywhere to live. Um, and I was moving for an opportunity that wasn't really going to pay me much money because it was an internship. So it was a big leap of faith, um, but it was definitely the best decision I think I've ever made. And that excitement that I had for the opportunity uh, was, you know, only enhanced when I got to Australia, because these were the type of facilities um, that I was greeted with. So a massive um, strength and conditioning area. Um, equipment under the swimming pools to allow us to sort of monitor and analyze um, the swimmer's stroke, a recovery center and high class laboratory um, centers. But not only were the facilities and the equipment absolutely fantastic, probably for me, the thing that was the most important was the individuals that I got to work with. Um, so here are some of the sports science gurus that I spent my time working with and the crazy thing for me was that only a few months previously I'd been referencing these people when I was writing my university undergraduate sort of dissertation and assignments and here I was on the other side of the world now working with these people day in day out um, helping them with their research and helping them as they supported elite athletes so it really was a phenomenal opportunity and definitely the start of my career in sports science. Uh, another quick film reference for you. Uh, yes, ma'am. So whilst I was at the AIS, I definitely tried to be yes woman. Um, I tried to take on as many opportunities as possible. Obviously, I think that's a fine balance. Uh, I think it's important not to kind of overcommit so that you end up perhaps not doing things as well as you could. But I really tried to take on as many opportunities as I could, say yes to as many things as possible, really just to give myself, you know, the best experience um, whilst I was over there. So we've got some images here on the top right hand side. We can see an individual who just looks like they're asleep. Actually, they're sleeping in an altitude chamber, which was housed within the physiology lab at the AIS. So one of the tasks that I frequently said yes to um, was to monitor the altitude house. So that meant staying up all night um, outside of the altitude house and monitoring and measuring um, the levels just to make sure that everyone inside was safe and was well. So that was something that I did. Um, I also worked across lots of different sports. Um, we've got some images here on the bottom of surf lifesaving. Um, before I went to Australia, I didn't even know that was a sport. Um, yet while I was there, I got to work closely with their elite athletes and even contributed to a research article on that sport. So I think initially in that year, in Australia really was just about trying to immerse myself in the sport and just try to learn as much as I could from those brilliant individuals I was working with in the department. And I really think uh, this is true. So the AIS helped me become a proper sports scientist. So I'd spent my undergraduate degree getting a good theoretical understanding, but actually I didn't really know how to physically be a sports scientist 
So going to the AIS really helped me um, realize what was required if you wanted to practically work as a sports scientist in the field. And there were a few kind of key messages I took away. Firstly, I got a really good understanding of how to work with coaches and athletes. So whilst I was there, I worked with many different coaches and athletes across lots of different sports. And that gave me a really good understanding of how to approach certain individuals, how to interact with them and how to adapt my communication style. I think possibly it helped me being in Australia because the individuals I was working with were household names to Australians, um, but myself, I didn't necessarily know all of them as well as an Australian would. Um, and therefore it took a little bit of the sort of stardom factor out of that. And I think that stood me in good stead kind of moving forwards. The big thing I learned at the AIS was how to use Excel. Um, and that has stood me in good stead throughout the rest of my career. It's definitely saved me hours and hours of time. Um, I guess now perhaps people uh, in some ways may have moved away from Excel um, and are using things such as Power BI or Python, um, but still that kind of understanding of data analysis um, is really important because it can help the way that you present your data, um, but it can also crucially save you lots of time. I also learned about being on the road. Um, and by that, I mean working and living with coaches and athletes and performers. Um, and often that's the environment a sports scientist will find themselves in. So they'll be living and working with these players, these athletes while they perform. And that's a highly pressurized environment. Um, and it's definitely a unique environment. So learning that kind of skill set early was really important for me. Um, I learned how to network and I've put it in kind of commas just because I sometimes feel that the term network um, can be a little bit negative. Um, sometimes people kind of relate it to um, what can you do for me? Um, that's definitely not the kind of network I like to develop. Uh, I like people. I like chatting. I like making friends. So I always try to do those things first. Um, if it ends up being a kind of research or work collaboration, great. But I always try to start with just having a good conversation with someone. And I'm really pleased that those individuals I put up um, on the slide in terms of the AIS, I'm still in regular contact with some of those individuals now. And that might be socially. Um, it's not always about work. I also felt that when I was in Australia, um, I actually needed to study a little bit more. So whilst I had an undergraduate degree, I didn't really feel that gave me the necessary underlying theory um, to the level that I wanted it to be. So whilst I was finishing off my year in Australia, I decided that it was really important I came home to um, undertake a master's degree just to really try and increase uh, my level of knowledge in the area. Finally, I learned what it's like to live uh, on not too much money, uh, which, you know, is necessary for lots of people in lots of um, different um, spheres of work, not just in sport. But it is important, I think, when you're kind of entering into a profession that, you know, sometimes you you start at that base level. So that was kind of a life skill learned as well. So I came back to the UK. Uh, as I said, I started doing my master's um, and I got what Again, I would probably often describe as another lucky break. So I started working for the FA. So that's the Football Association. And that role, um, I was working with the England women's football teams. So the youth teams, so the under 15s, 17s and 19s. And the reason I got into the job um, was that I actually knew someone who currently was working for the FA. And again, that's common within sport. It's common within soccer. Um, someone often opens the door for you, which is brilliant. But then I guess it's, uh, you know, it's down to you to sort of stay in the room and show that you've got the skills and the knowledge and experience and that you deserve to be there, even though someone has sort of given you a helping hand um, to get in. So this role um, with the FA, so I was an itinerant sports scientist. Um, and by that, I worked with the younger age groups for the England women's teams um, when they were on training camps. So they would often happen um, at weekends or um, holidays because obviously these, you know, these girls were at school normally. 
So a photo on the right hand side of I think that was my second um, training camp with the players. Um, so some of those players have gone on to represent sort of senior teams um, and some of them are currently representing England now. Um, so brilliant to work with sort of the younger athletes and see them develop. Whilst um, doing this itinerant role, I also did some strength and conditioning support for players in the region that I lived. So that was up in Liverpool and that meant early mornings and also evening work. And that was because at the time, the women's game in this country was not professional. Um, so the players had other jobs. Uh, so it meant that, you know, we needed to fit their strength and conditioning sessions in and around their other employment. So again, just kind of coming back to how I would describe my role at the FA, and I'd often say, yep, it was another lucky break. But again, to think about that in a little bit more detail and probably a little bit more objectively, actually, I had some experience. So I'd worked that year at AIS. Um, I'd worked with elite athletes and coaches um, and various other experiences along the way. I had qualifications, so I had an undergraduate degree. I now had a master's degree and I also had some strength and conditioning qualifications. Crucially also, I was flexible. Uh, as you saw on the previous slide, there was a lot of unsociable hours, shall we say. So weekends, early mornings, late nights, holidays. And I was available and I was prepared to kind of work at those unsociable times. So it could be framed as lucky, um, but it could also be um, that I'm ticking some important boxes along the way. I continued kind of to work for the FA um, for the next few years. Um, my roles changed slightly. Um, and after I'd worked with various age groups, I then started working with the under 19s predominantly. And they were a busy age group. Uh, they had lots of sort of tournaments um, on a yearly basis. So the number of days that I spent working with them were around about 100 days per year. Um, alongside that, I also worked at the Loughborough Player Development Centre. And that was where the young, talented players in the country, a lot of them went to study at Loughborough to do their, you know, their A-levels or their university degrees. But then they also trained together as a squad whilst they were at Loughborough. So really this under 19 age group, I spent a lot of time with them. So a lot of them were at this Loughborough Player Development Centre. So I worked with them there in the week. Um, and then also I supported them when they were away with their England trips. So it was kind of a, a mi mix mash of jobs. Um, and really it, qu it equated to a full time job, um, but it was still kind of on a consultancy contract. And again, that's quite commonplace. I think when you're starting off within a sport, you may have lots of different roles that you put together to kind of make a full time job. And whilst I was working with this age group, the under 19s, uh, this is when I had my probably most favorite moment of working for the FA. Uh, I think if you kind of look across the pictures, you can see some pretty happy faces. Um, and that's because we'd won the gold medal and we'd won the championship for the Euros. Um, in 2009. And the reason I say that this is my favorite moment, it may not be the most high profile moment I had at the FA, but it's my favorite because of the team cohesion. Um, so there was just a really strong relationship between the players and the staff and everyone just really felt like it was something special. We're all on the same page. Everyone was working towards a really common goal. And that was spearheaded by the head coach, Mo Marley, who you can see in the third picture. So it was a really unique environment. And I think the last picture, the one on the far right hand side, really depicts that. So that's the two goalkeepers from the tournament. One of those goalkeepers played every single minute of the tournament. And the other goalkeeper did not play a single minute within the tournament. But I think if you look at the picture, you'd be pretty hard pressed to know which one played and which one didn't play. And I just don't think you get that um, relationship between players um, that often. So it really felt like a, a unique and special time. So I continued to sort of transition into different roles within the FA. And in 2010, uh, there was a vacancy for the head of sports science role um, for the women's teams. So the person who was doing the job previously moved on to a new role and then they advertised the position 
I was encouraged to apply, uh, particularly because I'd sort of been in the system and I'd worked with the players and staff for a number of years. So I applied for the role um, and I got that role in 2010. So as part of the role, I got to work at this fantastic place that you can see on the picture. So this is St George's Park, which is the training base for all England women's and men's teams. So a really fantastic um, training facility. And whilst I was in this role, um, we also had Olympic Games, uh, World Cups and also European Championships. So it was a really exciting time um, to be in this role with the FA. But whilst I was in the role, um, I was actually fortunate enough to do some kind of women in leadership um, type courses. And, and that's partly where I want to touch again on this theme of luck. Whilst I was on the course, um, I learned one of these facts um, that actually half of women attribute their career successes to luck. Um, and that number's a lot smaller in men. So it's definitely a trait in women that they sort of recognize any successes they've had and they put them down to luck. And actually, when I heard this fact, I was like, that's exactly what I do. So when people had asked me about the AIS, I would say I was lucky to get the role in Australia. I was lucky to start working with the FA. And recently, um, there's been some uh, research into this area. And what they found is that actually what we do is that we attribute knowledge in women to luck, but we attribute knowledge in men to ability. And actually that can be quite dangerous um, if we think about sort of young females or females of any age for that matter. If we're actually saying that if you do well at something or you're knowledgeable at something, but we're saying that that's down to luck, what that's actually saying is it's not your ability. And it's also saying that, you know, you got lucky and it's not giving people or not giving women confidence in the fact that they might be able um, to do that again. So I just sort of found that really interesting, which kind of gave me almost the inspiration for the talk today, because I know I'm definitely guilty of it. And it's something that I want to correct in myself, um, but also I thought it might be interesting um, for you tuning in today. So I guess to kind of get back to my story a little bit. Um, so whilst I was in this head of sports science role, um, really the job was divided into kind of two main bits. So there was the day job and then there was the management job. In terms of the day job, um, it was my responsibility to basically look after the senior women's team um, from a sports science perspective. So my role um, incorporated things such as fitness and conditioning, um, recovery sessions, monitoring training, nutrition, hydration. So it was a really varied role. Um, and I traveled with the senior women when they were in training camps, fixtures and tournaments. And altogether, it depended on the year, but that would equate to about 120 days per year. So a big, a big time com commitment for one portion of the job. Um, with that role, uh, there, kept, there came some, you know, unbelievable highs. Again, I look at these pictures and they make me smile. Um, this was, you know, working with some brilliant staff, some brilliant players, um, getting to travel the world, seeing players develop. So we've got some young players in these pictures that have gone on and progressed. Personally, some great opportunities, pictures at Downing Street, Buckingham Palace, you know, the Olympic torch. So they're things that you don't get in your regular day job, um, traveling the world, some really fantastic opportunities. Um, and I'm always very grateful the fact that I got to have those opportunities. With every high comes not necessarily a low, but just uh, a different side of the coin and kind of coming back to this theme of life on the road. Again, I think this is your final film reference, but it can be a little bit like Groundhog Day. So I've got some icons at the bottom, eat, sleep, train, repeat. And often what would happen when we were away with the team is that, you know, all we'd see would be airports, hotels, training grounds and match stadiums. So often, you know, my friends would take the mick and they'd say that I was, you know, traveling the world and, you know, basically on a jolly. But actually, you know, you didn't get to see that much of the place that you were in. Having said that, I did always make sure that I got up an hour early before the players, just so I could actually kind of embrace the city or the country that I was in and get to see some of the sites. But 
that did make me a bit tired sometimes on the road, getting up that extra bit early. The other aspect of life on the road is that there's a lot of kit to move. Um, so just some of these pictures will give you an indication of kind of what it's like. You know, we're constantly moving things from different hotel rooms to training grounds to stadiums, trying to set up uh, mobile recovery areas in hotels, cleaning up in the showers. So I wouldn't necessarily say this is the lows, it's just the other side of the highs perhaps. I mentioned that within the role, there was this day job and management job. Um, and the management job really was to oversee the sports science support across the women and girls pathway. So that meant everything from the really young players up to the senior players and really to just lead on that sports science support. In turn, I was responsible for recruiting and managing staff um, and liaising with the head coaches across all the different age groups. So I'm sure you can probably appreciate across traveling with the senior women's team and then managing the whole program, it was a really big job. But to make my life a little bit harder, um, I decided it would be a good idea to do a PhD at the same time as well. So I wasn't happy just being busy with work. I thought we'd be busy and do a PhD as well. Um, but the reason I chose to do a PhD was that I've always been really evidence-based in terms of the work that I wanted to do with the players, I wanted to make sure that it was grounded in theory and that it was based on kind of research. But what I was beginning to find with working with these elite women's players was that there wasn't really much research. Um, and therefore in discussions with colleagues that I previously worked with at Liverpool John Moores, we decided that the best way to make sure that I was able to use evidence to help inform what I was doing with the players was basically to create our own evidence. So to do a PhD on these elite players. So that's what we did. And I was fortunate to work with some great people at Liverpool John Moores. So Warren Gregson, Barry Drust and Matt Weston. They supported me through my PhD. But also critically, I got great support from the FA as well. So Hope Powell, who was the manager at the time of the England women's senior team, and then Ian Beasley and John Iger, who were head of medical and sports science, respectively, they were all really crucial um, in helping me kind of manage the workload and seeing the importance of the PhD alongside the role as head of sports science. So to start with um, for the PhD, what we wanted to do was review the current literature. Um, as I mentioned, there wasn't necessarily a lot of it. So that was our starting point to see what had been done and then to identify any gaps in the research that we could help fill. And the PhD, we really used this framework, um, which was proposed by Tom Riley. So what we wanted to do, first of all, was to understand what are the demands of the game? Because we really wanted to know what are the players required to do, and therefore we can understand how to train them effectively. So that was our starting point, the demands of the game. We then wanted to assess the physical ability of the players. And then we wanted to use those two things to help us inform and make detailed um, decisions around selection and training. So that was basically the framework of the PhD. You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to run through all of the data in the PhD, but just to kind of give you some highlights, really. As I said, the first thing we looked at were the demands of the game. Um, so this graph along the bottom, we've got different playing positions. So central defenders, wide defenders, central midfielders, wide midfielders and attackers. And the green bars represent the total distance covered. So if we look at the central midfielders in the middle, they're covering about 11,000 meters in a game compared to the central defenders, which are covering about 9,500 meters. The red dots, they represent high speed running and again, we can see differences based on different playing positions. We also looked at some sprint data because there wasn't really much of that published for the women's players. And we found that about 50% of sprints were explosive. And that means the players are going from a fairly stationary start to then sprinting, whereas 50% were leading. And that means the players were kind of doing a rolling start into their sprint. And as you can see by the numbers at the bottom, the vast majority of the sprints were quite short in nature, so either five metres or 10 metres. 
So taking this data together, along with lots of other information, we were able to build up a much better picture of what the players did in the games, um, which ultimately helped me make informed decisions about how we were going to train them um, and how we were going to help them progress. So that was really important for us to understand the demands of the game. The other aspect, uh, main aspect of the PhD was trying to understand this physical ability of the players. So myself um, and a colleague um, who was working as a head of physio, Tracy Lewis, we set up this testing and screening program. Um, I say it's sort of linked into the PhD, but the primary reason for doing this was to really understand um, where each player was at from a physical perspective. So we did a number of field based tests. And we also did a number of sort of screening tests. So on the left hand side, you can see in pink, the kind of field tests that we did. So we looked at anthropometry, so skin folds, height and mass of players, um, and then some sort of fairly standard field tests. So we looked at sprints, jumps, repeated speed, um, yo-yo intermittent recovery. From a screening perspective, um, the physios looked at a functional movement screen, and then you can see there's a number of tests below there looking at sort of strength and uh, range of movement, etc. So with all this kind of information, we were able to get a really good picture of where the players were at. Um, and what we did with that information was, first and foremost, we used that information to help inform the players about the types of training that they needed to do. So we've got a front cover here for Farrah Williams. In the middle, we've got a data sheet. Um, just to clarify, that's not uh, Farrah's data and I've blanked out the player's name just for confidentiality as to who that player is. As you can see, when you look at the report, there's quite a lot of information on there. Um, we use various reports throughout um, this testing and screening program. Um, but I think one thing that stands out is that we're giving the players a lot of information here. And the reason we're doing that is because we'd worked really hard with the players in terms of education and they had a really good understanding of some of this data. So we didn't just give them a sheet of paper. We did number, a number of workshops with them and we'd explain their results in detail, which allowed us to give them quite a lot of information. You can see that there's some colors on the chart as well. And because we'd collected quite a lot of data, we had a good understanding of what certain levels were for each um, age group so we could understand whether their performance was good relative to their peers of that age group or whether it was perhaps below average and we could feed that back accordingly to players so after testing each player would get sort of an individualized program which would have a specific focus um, and also some individual supplementary sessions we also had kind of a long and um, long-term plan with the testing where we we created some research as a result of the fitness testing so here you can see the title of a paper which we published a couple of years ago and what we did with this paper in terms of the study design it was a retrospective analysis so this data was collected on young players who had the potential um, to progress and what we did was we analyzed 300 Nearly, nearly 300 youth players. Um, and we analyzed their data when they were around about 12 to 15 years old. So that was when they fitness tested, but we then looked to see what happened to them five or six or seven years later. Did those players when, who were 12, did they go on to represent England at under 17 level? So that's why it was um, classed as a retrospective analysis. So when we put all this data together, what we found was that there was one test um, that did allow us to predict whether players would go on to represent England at um, an older age group. And that was the yo-yo intermittent recovery test. Um, so you can see in the graph on the right hand side, we've got two shapes. Um, the first shape um, is the data for the players that didn't progress. OK, and their average yo-yo performance was around about a thousand meters. The shape on the right hand side holds the data for the players that did progress. So those ones that were deemed successful and went on to represent at an older age group. And you can see their average yo-yo performance is higher than those players that didn't progress. So we can see for yo-yo performance, there seems to be some 
something there which is showing that players with a better yo-yo score actually went on um, to be successful in their future career. And we took that one stage further by creating kind of a prediction um, graph. So the graph on the bottom, what we can see is we can look and see when a player hits a certain distance covered on the yo-yo score, we can then read across on the graph to see what that would mean in terms of their probability of selection for the next age group. So we can see that kind of fitness testing and screening had some short-term aims in terms of helping the players individually, but also some medium and long-term aims, which gave us a better understanding of a group of players together and even allowed us to do some prediction. Part of the presentation today, I was asked to think about my challenges in terms of working in applied sports science. Um, and I'm pleased to say that I didn't actually come up with that many, um, which I think means that I've generally had a good experience. Um, I don't know if that's because I was a, a female working in women's football. Um, so I wasn't working in kind of a male dominated environment. I can't comment on that because that's not the environment I've been in, but I'm pleased to say I didn't have a huge number of challenges. One thing that I did find interesting was that within the FA, all of the heads of department were the individuals that worked for the men's teams, not the women's teams. So sometimes um, things were often seen from the men's team's perspective and not necessarily the women's team's perspective. Um, but, you know, that wasn't a huge problem. I was happy to have conversations about that to make sure sort of the women's teams were getting their fair share of airtime and that things were getting explored from both male and female team perspectives. I think probably the main challenge um, in the applied world for me personally was the lack of time. As I alluded to, you know, it was a really big job. Um, also doing my PhD on top. I kind of felt like I was on a delivery treadmill. So I didn't get a huge amount of time to think. It was just get up and deliver content, deliver sessions, deliver programs, deliver meetings, and kind of felt like I was on that treadmill all the time. So I didn't get a huge amount of time to reflect. Um, since moving into a slightly less a uh, fast paced environment, I think I reflect more. Uh, I think that's made me a better practitioner and arguably probably a better uh, person and a more chilled out person as well. Another aspect um, in that head of sports science role was that I became quite a generalist. Um, I mentioned all the different areas, you know, I would look after from fitness and conditioning to nutrition to recovery. So you can end up being sort of, you know, a bit of a generalist and not really having a real specific focus and personally, I found that a little bit of a challenge when I left the FA, just in terms of working out where my skill set was and what I wanted to do moving forwards. So I guess that was the uh, that was the intro into the fact that I did leave the FA. Um, so in 2016, um, I decided it was time for a change. Uh, the picture on the left hand side probably shows a little bit how I felt at the time. I think I was just tired. I felt like I had loads of things going on, loads of lists everywhere. And I was just really ready for like a change of scene. Um, I wanted to spend more time at home. I wanted to spend more time with friends and family. Um, so the picture on the right hand side is what I did. Uh, I bought a camper van, had some time out, saw a bit of the world without having a football team in tow and just enjoyed a little bit of a, a rest and a change. It didn't last long. Um, I soon got a position at the University of Chichester. For those of you that don't know where Chichester is, um, it's a small city, south coast of the UK, lovely part of the world. Uh, the picture at the top is our university campus. So it's a really nice traditional university. And the role I went into was a little bit different. Um, so I actually worked on a research project, um, which was funded by the Ministry of Defence. Um, and actually, we were using catapult units to analyse and assess what the military personnel were doing. And that was to inform their employment standards. So it was really interesting how I took my skill set from applied sports science and then put that into kind of a different environment. So I was really pleased at that point in time to just have a little bit of a change but still using the skills that I'd originally developed. When I started my first day on the research project, uh, took a few calls on the way home. People asked me, how was your first day? Did you love it? And I said, mm, I'm not sure. So I gave it a five out of 10. Um, and that's not because the research project, I was really fascinated by that. And I was really excited to get going. 
But the reason I gave it a five out of 10 is because when I went into the office, um, I was greeted with a big calendar and basically I had to sign up to going away on loads of trips and spending lots of time again away from home and working on this big research project. So the, one of the reasons I wanted to kind of get out of elite sport for a while was to reconnect with friends and family and actually going into this role, I felt that, you know, I was going to be in the same position again. Um, I did stay in the role for a number of months and I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but then a new opportunity presented itself at Chichester. And that was actually a lecturing role in sports performance analysis. There were three aspects to the job. Um, so you needed to be competent in physical analysis. So again, kind of using catapult units or similar video analysis. Um, so using software such as Huddle. Um, and you also needed to be competent going into kind of elite sporting environments. So someone at Chichester suggested this job to me. But when I looked at the job description, I was like, mm, I'm not sure. I feel comfortable on physical analysis. I feel comfortable on the elite environments, but I'm not really comfortable on video analysis. So I didn't know what to do. Um, and that kind of, again, just to touch on this differences between women and men, which I think is important, that this is really common, that women will only apply for a job if they meet 100% of the qualifications and the criteria. But men, they often apply even if they only meet around about 60% of those criteria. And that came from the Hewlett Packard report. And they delved into that a little bit more to really try to understand why women didn't necessarily put themselves forward unless they felt they hit every single criteria. And this were, these were some of the quotes. So I didn't think they would hire me since I didn't meet the qualifications and I didn't want to put myself out there if I was likely to fail or I was following the guidelines about who should apply. And this is, you know, it's a really common situation where women just don't apply. But based on some kind of encouragement internally for myself with that job, even though I arguably only met 66% of the criteria, kind of two out of the three, I decided to apply and I got the job. And the job, and that's the job I currently do now, uh, this lecturing role, and I absolutely love it. I get to teach, I get to research, and I get to work as an applied practitioner. So I get the development, like helping students develop. I get to research in the areas that I'm interested in. So I've continued to work in women's soccer. I've continued to research in that area. And I get to do applied work. So I currently consult for Northern Ireland women's team and some other club teams. So I get really good flexibility to work in the areas that I'm interested in. But I needed that push to go for it, even though I didn't necessarily hit all the criteria. Since then, I've not needed the push quite so often. Um, so last year, uh, a part-time job came up at Anglia Ruskin University. Uh, they were looking for a module tutor um, for coaching for performance in football. This was just to go alongside Chichester. So I looked at the job. Um, I didn't necessarily hit the criteria, but I thought, do you know what? I might have something that they might be interested in. I might be able to offer them something different. So I didn't need the push this time. I just took the leap um, and I got that job. And that's something else that I've added to my, you know, my CV and I'm really enjoying doing. This, I guess, is the question that I get asked quite a lot is, do I miss it? And I think what people mean by that is, do I miss working with players and coaches regularly? Do I miss kind of doing that day in, day out? Um, the answer is probably no. Um, and the reason is because I still get to do it. So I still get to do my research. I still get to do my applied consultancy. Um, I definitely wouldn't change any of the amazing experiences that I've had along the way. Um, but ultimately, at the moment, I get a better balance of sort of work life balance. And I still get to do still get to do the cool bits and still get to work with the players. Um, but I get a bit of, bit of a better balance. So that's hopefully a bit of an insight into my career um, and also hopefully a bit of a touch on some of the, you know, the relevant issues in terms of differences between women and men. So I'm happy to take any questions um, if any have been in the chat um, and just thank you again for your time and hopefully you found some of that content useful. Yeah, thank you, Naomi. It was a great, engaging story you shared with us. And uh, we can go on with the questions. 
and um, I want to ask people to feel free to uh, to put their questions in the Q and A box. We start with the first question. Dave uh, would like to know your definition by log. So, uh, what do you specifically mean by log when you uh, describe some phases of your journey in sport analytics? Oh, what do I mean by log? Sorry. Um... I guess I was being a little bit uh, playing on the term there. So, I mean, I think there is an element of luck to some degree. Um, and I think that's why I alluded to the kind of sliding doors moment in terms of if I hadn't have been looking at that website and I hadn't seen the vacancies, you know, that might not have, um, I might not have started at the AIS, but ultimately I guess some of those um, characteristics um, in terms of patience and perseverance I think those things kind of stand you in good stead. So my story might have been different and I might have started somewhere else, um, but hopefully I'd have still kind of had the characteristics to pull me through and to maybe, who knows, I might have worked in a different sport, not in football. Um, so I think, you know, there is some element of luck, but I think ultimately you can kind of create your own luck by, you know, the types of attitude, you know, for, for example, as I said, trying to take on opportunities to get experience um, and sort of be the yes woman and learn lots of different things. So I think it's a, a little bit of a play on the word luck that you often create your own. Awesome, thank you. Hannah asks when you were in recruitment for the FA of the sports scientists for the women and girls team, what did you look for? How did this differ from what skills, qualities, or qualifications you had when you were recruited by the FA? Mm, good question. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think when I was recruiting staff myself, um, I think what I looked for, obviously there were certain criteria that they had to fulfill. So perhaps having, you know, the relevant degree program, the relevant qualifications to ensure that they were safe and effective to practice. But for me, it's a little bit more than that. And I don't think it, just having the qualifications is the most important thing. And I would often look for sort of the personality of the individual and how well I thought they'd be able to interact um, with the staff and with the players. Because um, ultimately, you may be the most knowledgeable sports scientist in the world. Um, but if you can't get your message across to the players or you can't relate to them, uh, then it doesn't matter how good you are because those players aren't going to kind of buy into the program. So I think, you know, it's important to kind of have rounded individuals um, that have got different skill sets. And in terms of, I guess, differences to when I was recruited, um, I think probably the recruitment process, as things do, I think it evolved. Um, and there were probably, at the time I was looking for individuals, there were probably more kind of stringent criteria um, as to what was required. Um, but for myself personally, the other thing I, I always wanted to have were, I guess, not carbon copies of myself. Um, as I mentioned, with the role being really diverse, um, it was actually really important to try to have people who would kind of complement each other. So as a team, it would be a good mix of people who perhaps had expertise in strength and conditioning, someone else who may have more expertise in nutrition or recovery so kind of to get that kind of broader understanding as a team rather than let's just try and have lots of people who all look the same and then all have the same ideas great and uh we can have the last question here um yeah, there are other questions and we try to answer all of them if possible. So someone asked, have you done anything with load management? If so, what was it and what software did you use if not Excel? Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, we did, um, we did work with load management. Um, we had GPS units um, whilst I was you know, with the FA um, and we did predominantly at that time, because uh, it is going back a few years now when I was sort of on the ground with the players there, um, we did sort of develop our own system via Excel um, to sort of pull in the data um, from, you know, the GPS systems to then kind of create create our own type of load management spreadsheets. Um, 
I don't think in terms of software, I don't think there's a right and a wrong. Um, as I'm sure people are aware, there's lots and lots of different um, options available on the market. Um, but ultimately, it depends what you're comfortable using um, to try and get the best analysis. Um, and sometimes the best analysis isn't the most detailed analysis. Um, the best analysis might be focusing on three key metrics and focusing on them really well and making sure that everyone understands them. So sometimes my work with players and coaches would be actually stripping it back and focusing on less and then building it up to look at more information over time. So yeah, predominantly in my time at, at the FA, it was Excel, um, but I don't think people should be kind of shoehorned by the system. It's kind of what you do with the data and how you then use that data to inform work with players and coaches, in my opinion anyway. Great, and we can answer one last question. Um, so Caroline asked, working in elite sport can be repetitive or a young person job as it is all encompassing and requires long hours. This perhaps makes the role less appealing to women. What can we do to change the demands made on the sports scientists in the elite environment to attract more females into the role and keep them? Mm. Yeah, really. Yeah. Um, I think... I don't necessarily know if it's exclusive to kind of differences between women and men. I, I, I think it is to some degree, but also a lot of men that I know who've also worked in kind of elite sporting environments, they also feel that there's a shelf life. So, you know, it's so fast paced and after five, eight, 10 years, they might also feel like they need a change. And I, I think what I've done is probably not uncommon in the fact that people work in applied elite sport and then they go into like lecturing or an academic role just because of that change in work life balance. So I don't think it's exclusively a male female thing. Um, however, possibly for females, um, sometimes I guess the onus might be more on sort of family and being that individual that perhaps stays at home with, with if there's family, if there's children. Um, so I, I can see where it might be more pronounced with women. In terms of what we can do, um, I think it's tricky. <laughs> I'm not sure I have not sure I have the answers for that. I mean, one thing that I think has positively happened since I left the FA is obviously the way that I showed you what my job was in the presentation, that's not someone's job now. So that job has been broken down in, and I don't know how many, but I know there's multiple people who do aspects of that job. Um, so the FA have kind of restructured that so that some of those responsibilities are shared across multiple people. So again, I'm not privy to how those individuals are getting on, but hopefully by dividing the work up into, you know, more people's roles, it might allow them to have greater longevity um, in the role because, yeah, I don't think, you know, I really admire the people who stay in for, you know, 10, 20, 25 years, um, because it's definitely not for everyone. So I'm not sure I answered that uh, fully, but I think it's a I think it's a big question. And I do think even just, you know, awareness um, about sort of the dropout rate for practitioners, I think will help kind of stimulate the conversation um, and hopefully, you know, things will improve over time. Yeah, great. Uh, so I guess we are done with the questions. Thank you, Naomi and everyone for attending. We will be sending the recording. And next Wednesday, we have Hannah Druitt, England and Wales Cricket Board, will share how technology has played a key role in the development of her athletes and how it has supported her own career growth. So see you everyone next Wednesday. And um, yeah. Have a great afternoon.